Um, and now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for the Clem McDonald Lecture, Dr. Eric Schneider, Executive Vice President um, of the Quality Measurement and Research Group at the National Committee for Quality Assurance, known to most of us as NCQA. Uh, Dr. Schneider is the former Senior Vice President for Policy and Research at the Commonwealth Fund where he provided strategic guidance on the fund's research topics in policy, health services delivery, and public health, uh, trained in primary care, general internal medicine, and health services research. Dr. Schneider is among the nation's leading health services researchers. His research has spanned health policy, quality measurement, quality improvement, delivery system in innovation, primary care, health information technology, and the effects of health insurance and access to care for vulnerable populations. Prior to joining the fund, Dr. Schneider was the principal researcher at the RAND Corporation, and he held the RAND Distinguished Chair in Healthcare Quality. He holds a BS in Biology from Columbia University, a Master of Science from the University of California, Berkeley, and a medical degree from the University of California, San Francisco. Dr. Schneider is a member of the Board of Academy Health and has been elected to fellowship in both the American College of Physicians and the National Academy of Social Insurance. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Schneider. Thank you, Marjorie. Thank you for that very kind introduction. And uh, I'm truly delighted to be here to uh, deliver the Clem McDonald Lecture. Um, I'm a physician, and as Marjorie said, a health policy researcher who's been involved in the quality movement for uh, going on 30 years now. And um, uh, although I've only crossed paths with Clem McDonald a couple of times, his work actually profoundly influenced my career and my thinking, and indeed the field of uh, healthcare quality as I hope I can describe to you today. Um, he, uh, um, and I'll say more about that later in the talk. So uh, I'm also excited to share the story of NCQA because uh, NCQA, for those who don't know it, is, uh, has had a big influence on the quality movement, uh, the quality agenda in the United States and actually even overseas. Uh, so I'll, I'll uh, be reflecting on the quality movement of the last 20 years, but through the, the lens of the story of NCQA. What I hope to do during the next uh, 40 minutes or so is to uh, describe the U.S. quality journey, uh, to ask the question, is that quality journey improving care? Is the strategy that we're using improving care? And then I want to describe... Um, uh, two NCQA initiatives that I think are really vital and uh, connect to uh, the, the uh, agenda that Dr. Patzer outlined, making care equitable and leveraging digital health data for performance measurement. So let me start by introducing NCQA. Uh, to those who don't know it, NCQA is a nonprofit uh, founded in 1990, uh, organized uh, with the mission of improving the quality of health care. Uh, it's governed by an independent board of directors headquartered in Washington, D.C., and now has uh, 300, almost 400 employees. The, um, uh, it's an organization that um, influences healthcare quality through its accreditation and other evaluation programs, through measurement, validation, and information products, through research and services that we provide, and through education and publications. Uh, the, the kind of value proposition of NCQA is uh, to establish trust in measurement and accountability for quality. Uh, so there are sort of four basic ways that that occurs. One is through aligning, helping to align the objectives of regulatory agencies, payers, and uh, delivery organizations. Uh, the second is to drive improvement through measurement and through uh, 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 assessment of performance against quality standards. Uh, third is to validate uh, the measurement and data that are used in this uh, enterprise so that people have confidence in the results. And then uh, I, what I would call the consumer uh, mechanism is sort of to help organizations differentiate themselves related to quality. So essentially, so organizations, whether those are 
uh, large uh, delivery organizations, delivery systems, or uh, primary care providers or other clinicians can differentiate themselves in terms of uh, the uh, quality of care they provide. Uh, as I mentioned, there are really three levers that NCQA draws on to drive improvement in the, in the healthcare system. Uh, the, the most innovative really is the measurement lever. Uh, so providing measures to uh, health outcomes, clinical quality and patient experience uh, and uh, collecting data and reporting the data. Uh, the accreditation programs uh, for health plans specifically and some accountable care organizations. Uh, and then finally, there are recognition programs. So we recognize physician practices like patient center medical homes and uh, other specialized care models like diabetes care models, behavioral health care models, with the notion that um, they can get um, a uh, badge of recognition uh, that um, signals the, the, their commitment and their ability to provide high quality. Uh, just for some other background, NCQA is the largest accreditor of health plans. Uh, we are, uh, 42 states use or require NCQA accreditation, 178 million people. That's uh, three quarters of insured Americans are in plans, enrolled in plans that NCQA accredits. And that's uh, over 1,100 uh, health plans uh, in the, the nation that are um, NCQA accredited. And then, um, as I mentioned, we have measurement and reporting, and that's known as the Health Plan Effectiveness Data and Information Set, or HEDIS. Uh, it's broadly known, and uh, uh, about 203 million people, or 61% of the population, are in plans that report on uh, these quality measures. But I want to rewind back, because I think we're at an interesting moment, and it's uh, useful to reflect on the origins of NCQA and the origins indeed of the quality movement itself uh, as we think about where we've been and where we hope to be going in the future. Uh, <clears throat> there's a, a challenge that uh, in the 1990s was uh, in early 2000s was uh, quite apparent. And the first challenge was that most Americans believed the healthcare system of the US was the best in the world, that no other country could come close. And that's uh, characterized by this comment that was made in the State of the Union address 2004 by uh, former President George Bush uh, in a State of the Union address. We have the best healthcare system in the world. Sort of miss this guy, actually. Um, if you think about the paradigm shift that was necessary at that point, researchers had been pointing out for really decades that the quality of care might not be the best in the, wor in, uh, in the US, that there were problems in healthcare. And uh, if you think about um, the power of uh, observation to change uh, the course of uh, deeply held beliefs, uh, it's interesting to go back and reflect on Galileo, who uh, 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 was operating at a time when the earth was the center of the universe and um, everything should revolve around the earth. That was a deeply held belief. And with a relatively inexpensive uh, telescope, which you can see there, uh, uh, wood and glass, uh, began to observe uh, a star in the sky, uh, which we now know as Jupiter, and noticed there were smaller stars uh, around it. And those smaller stars were moving in a pattern that was seemed disconnected from the uh, celestial heavens rotating around the Earth. Uh, you can actually have this experience yourself with a very inexpensive pair of binoculars. If you go out on a clear night, you can see those moons of Jupiter. And even over a few hours, you can see them move relative to the planet Jupiter. Uh, he recorded his observations uh, night after night uh, in a lengthy uh, treatise, and then uh, finally came to the conclusion that these were other heavenly bodies not revolving around the Earth, and published that, and then he and others uh, uh, actually sort of broke through uh, the belief system the, 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 that the uh, Earth was at the center of the universe and, and in fact, um, really changed uh, that for, for his troubles. He was actually excommunicated from the church and actually uh, uh, suffered uh, many indignities. But he did make the point that uh, uh, the Earth was not rotating, uh, that the heavens were not rotating around the Earth. I think we had a similar Galileo moment in the uh, 1990s, early 2000s, uh, uh, a particular study by Beth McGlynn and her colleagues at the Rand Corporation um, under the, the leadership of Bob Brook, 
that uh, really uh, thousands of uh, medical records collected uh, 400 uh, quality indicators uh, uh, that had been carefully designed and uh, concluded that about uh, half of encounters uh, for adults uh, in, in about half did they receive indicated care, half of, uh, of, of indicated care was delivered appropriately and the rest was uh, uh, not. Uh, it was about the same for pediatric care and then uh, for geriatric conditions, it was even worse, only a third of, uh, of situations where, uh, in a third of the situations where, where the quality standards met. And uh, that was a wake up call. And then uh, there were several other reports around that time summarizing the body of research that pointed out uh, um, the, the problems in the safety of care to err as human, uh, the quality of care crossing the quality chasm, and uh, equity in care, uh, unequal treatment. Uh, and these Institute of Medicine reports uh, drove quite a lot of uh, engagement in quality uh, and the quality agenda. And then this question that had uh, been raised by the statement of our president about the US having the best healthcare system in the world was addressed by the Commonwealth Fund uh, in the early 2000s as well, uh, who began to gather data standardized across the nations uh, included in uh, Australia, Canada, Germany, New Zealand, United Kingdom, and the U.S., high-income countries, uh, peers of the U.S., and found that the U.S. ranked six out of the six uh, on those quality indicators. Uh, and uh, uh, this, as a side note, actually maybe not a side note, we spent twice as much as those other countries per capita uh, delivering health care. So that uh, added to the uh, sense that something was not quite right in the US uh, quality system. Now, what was the solution to that? Well, <laughs> accountability for healthcare in, in, in the US uh, is a, a particularly complex problem. Uh, other countries, the other nations in that comparison have health ministries, they have budgets. Uh, their systems are complex too, don't get me wrong, uh, but they have uh, some levers at their disposal that we really lack in the US. Uh, we have a very complex payment system, set of payment systems, set of delivery systems. And uh, uh, this is a slide from uh, uh, that the Republicans put forward in 1992, uh, 93, uh, during the Clinton healthcare reform debate, uh, illustrating the complexity of the solution that the Clinton healthcare reform plan uh, uh, represented. And obviously, it's, a, it's an eye chart. Uh, but all of the different agencies are reflected here, the different payers, the different delivery systems, and then uh, the attempt by the Clinton healthcare reform to organize that into some sort of coherent system um, uh, really challenged, I think, most Americans' view of uh, what our healthcare system should be. Uh, we have a very unique system. It's half publicly funded and half privately funded, and that raises some challenges. <clears throat> But uh, nevertheless, uh, the um, quality measurement enterprise sort of got it rooted in the Donabedian's model of quality, uh, which I've sort of put here in a schematic, uh, including the structure of care, the bricks and mortar, the telemedicine today, the um, supporting infrastructure that people, uh, that clinicians and patients uh, do their work in, uh, the processes of care that clinicians deliver and engage with uh, in their engagements with uh, patients, and then the health outcomes that are produced. That's the classic Donabedian triad of structure process outcome. Uh, it's, you can sort of update it and think about access. Uh, people, in fact, Donabedian himself said, if people don't have access, then the rest of it is kind of irrelevant. Uh, and then uh, patient experience. Uh, is uh, another form of health outcome that Donabedian also talked about as the art of medicine or the art of care. Uh, and engaging patients uh, was really important. So reports on patient experiences can be thought of as a special kind of health outcome or outcome of the, of the enterprise of delivering care. And um, building on that, folks at NCQA and other places, and, and actually the RAND Health uh, study was also uh, on that, um, uh, used that as a grounding for its indicators. Um, NCQA started a process of implementing measurement and reporting using the health plan as sort of the base <clears throat> and um, a, a sort of a for, simply formulated measure, HEDIS measure, uh, which uh, I was actually at NCQA in the, the mid-1990s when we were sort of getting this off the ground, 
was implemented as uh, what is very familiar, I think, to most people today, uh, a denominator of people eligible for a particular service, uh, in this case, breast cancer screening, uh, defining that denominator, defining who's excluded from that denominator, and then the numerator measured as the number of people who get the service, uh, in this case, a mammogram within the last two years. Uh, and then uh, that is a cal calculate, used to calculate a um, uh, percentage performance. So what percent of the population of eligibles received the service? Pretty simple, uh, but actually the devil's in the details when you actually start to get into the nuances, especially of exclusions and exceptions. What uh, NCQA was able to do, though, was to take mostly administrative claims data. And it's actually useful to recall that the HIPAA regulation was being debated at this time. And um, claims data were not all that standardized either. There was a lot of cleaning up that was necessary to uh, make even this simple approach work. Um, and um, the other challenge was the limitation of the availability of clinical data from claims. So claims data themselves just don't have the nuance uh, that uh, allows for who, uh, defining who's eligible in a population and ensuring that the service was actually delivered or not. And uh, there are issues, <clears throat> I'm sure if any people in this room are familiar with, about claims data. So NCQA um, <clears throat> pioneered a hybrid method where uh, samples of medical records could be drawn as part of the uh, formal measurement and reporting scheme. And um, adding that to the administrative reporting sort of created a closer approximation of the truth. And then finally, there's a, a, a survey methodology that is still in play today of uh, surveying uh, people. That's the CAPS or Consumer Assessment Health Plan Study Survey. Uh, there's also a Medicare Health Outcomes Survey. Both of those are still operated by federal government today uh, in the Medicare program. And so uh, a lot of work went into sort of getting this launched. And then you can see here, uh, this is a, a, a 1998 uh, quality compass report. Um, I still have probably the three and a half inch floppy disk somewhere in a file. Uh, and it was, a, you know, their CD version and a, a book. Uh, and uh, uh, initially, because of some of the limitations of data, I think this is uh, a cervical cancer screening. Uh, you can see there are regional reports. So the first attempts to kind of compare the states. This is a little like, um, uh, it's probably uh, uh, to compare to uh, Galileo might be inappropriate, but uh, you know this was a first approximation of sort of what's the picture of the quality of care. And you can see only three quarters of people are getting the indicated uh, services. Now I'm going to fast forward because I think uh, what happened next is that that system grew uh, and uh, the number of measures expanded, uh, still very much grounded in evidence and expert review in multi-stakeholder consensus to develop those measures, design them, test them, and then put them into uh, the HEDIS uh, measurement program. And then the government adopted a lot of this and uh, quality reporting has become really embedded in federal programs, state programs, uh, all of the public uh, programs <clears throat> to varying degrees. <clears throat> and you can see from, uh, this is the Medicare Advantage STARS program, which is uh, uh, actually um, the basis for payment to health plans and actually millions of dollars sort of change direction to health plans from the federal government based on performance uh, and the number of stars that health plans earn. And I put in a red circle there, the uh, measures, the uh, staying healthy, managing chronic care, member experience measures that are included in the star rating. Several of those are HEDIS measures, especially managing chronic care and staying healthy. And um, so these measurement sets, which are updated and refreshed uh, over time, have a pretty fundamental role in defining uh, payment to Medicare Advantage plans. And this is a huge uh, uh, enterprise that's grown to the point where about half of Medicare beneficiaries uh, are enrolled in Medicare Advantage plans in 2022, and that's continuing to rise. So traditional fee-for-service Medicare is fading away, and Medicare Advantage is growing. Uh, there's also uh, a whole set of measurements, star ratings for the drug plans that uh, the Medicare program offers. And then... Um, you know, when something seems to work, people start applying it in all sorts of ways. 
And um, especially in the government, uh, since the mid 2000s, at least there, in fact, the early 2000s, 2010s, I think, uh, the bonus and penalty programs were put in uh, to the uh, uh, health hospital and physician sector. So hospitals actually now get bonuses and penalties depending on their performance on a variety of outcomes, safety indicators, efficiency and cost reduction indicators, clinical care process, and the experience of care. Um, this is, a, a, again, uh, both at the hospital level, but also in the what was formerly the MIPS program for uh, participating physicians, uh, which is now the MIPS Value Pathways program, as the uh, federal government uh, tries to re-engineer it uh, for greater effectiveness. And the, the table on the right shows some of the weightings uh, 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 on quality resource use, advancing care information, and clinical practice improvement activities. So how has healthcare quality changed with all that 20 years of effort at quality measurement? Uh, well, I had the pleasure of writing the uh, 2017 and the 2021 uh, um, uh, international comparison reports called Mirror Mirror uh, for the Commonwealth Fund. And uh, this is 72 indicators uh, composited uh, into a variety of domains. And, um, uh, compares now 11 countries, all high-income countries, to one another. Uh, and uh, uh, this sort of graphical display, I think, conveys nicely where the U.S. ranks. It ranks last, but it not only ranks last, but it's worse than the others by a far distance. This is standard deviations from the average for the 11 countries. Put in a top three average line there so you could sort of see the top performers, Norway, the Netherlands, and Australia who have kind of been vying for that top spot over the course of the 20 years. Every three years, this is a report, this report is issued. Uh, the UK used to be in the top. Uh, and I think as a result of budget cuts and severe challenges in the UK system, they've sort of dropped a bit. But the, but the main message is that the US and our neighbor to the North, Canada, uh, are, uh, are sort of uh, ranked 10 and 11. And that's been pretty consistent. As a validation of that, you know, more complex measurement system. If you just look at avoidable death rates and the 10-year reduction in avoidable mortality across these countries, pretty reliable set of indicators. Um, you can see that uh, the U.S. is on the high end, up on the right side there, um, higher avoidable mortality than other countries. Um, and also, the, over the 10-year period, had the smallest uh, reduction in avoidable mortality. All the other countries improved their avoidable mortality um, so, so at a, a greater percentage than the US, which only managed a 5% reduction. And this is prior to the pandemic. So there's another graph I could show you that shows that the US mortality rate surged as the other nations did. And then the other nations have improved again and the US is, retains a, a very high uh, mortality rate. And then the other problem that uh, was alluded to earlier is around equity. And there is a set of equity measures. There's an equity measurement uh, analysis in the Commonwealth Fund report. It's based on income because that's the only indicator or stratifier that's uh, available across the countries. And again, equity is a big challenge in the U.S. compared to the other countries. So we tend to think of other countries potentially having trouble, uh, but the high income countries as a whole uh, most of the others do better than we do even on equity. Again, Canada and the U.S. Um, um, sort of trailing the pack uh, in terms of equity. So should we change our quality approach? Um, I think our quality strategy in some ways is on the right track, but um, as uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt said at the Great Depression, uh, it's common sense to take a method and try it. If it fails, admit it, frankly, and try another. But I'll, above all, try something. So I wouldn't say we failed, but I don't know that we can point to success and say what we've been using to date in terms of measurement and payment incentives has been really driving quality improvement in the system. Um, and we wrote a commentary on this uh, when we looked at across the 11 countries uh, to see what is it that differentiates the top performers from the U.S., and um, uh, their ability to achieve high quality care. And um, out of this came four recommendations. Uh, the first was uh, all the other countries have universal insurance coverage. So the ACA and its attempts to create universal insurance coverage was a really important step. 
uh, toward uh, achieving universal coverage in the US. We don't have that tackled yet. Uh, primary care is a, a cornerstone in other countries, and our primary care system is both underinvested in, probably by about a third to half of what other countries spend on primary care, when you look at the budgets overall. Uh, and um, uh, primary care has been in trouble, and, and actually the latest, latest stresses of the pandemic and other economic forces are really driving uh, more challenges for primary care. The third is the administrative burden that the U.S. system puts on uh, doctors and patients. Uh, there's really uh, no parallel when you look at other countries in the way that our Byzantine payment systems and um, uh, you know prior authorization systems and everything that all of the the uh, paperwork. Uh, what's red tape is the term that sort of resonates across the the globe. Uh, we have a lot more red tape in our system, and I've visited some of these other systems and seen just what streamlined uh, administrative uh, care looks like. And sadly, our quality measurement system is contributing to that administrative burden. Uh, there are several reports out now on the millions of dollars that hospitals spend just to report on, and health plans are spending just to report on quality metrics. So there's really something kind of off about that. Our quality enterprise, uh, measurement enterprise, is sort of bolted on to a system that uh, in many hospitals, it's sort of like a parallel department. It doesn't actually drive improvement in the hospital. It's there as a, a response to the, the mandates or the payment uh, schemes. And then the last is uh, the income-related barriers that uh, especially children and young adults and working age adults face in the U.S. compared to other countries, our social service that is service spending is way is for that those populations is way below what it is in other countries, uh, and that that uh, probably sets people up to have chronic illness later in life uh, and other stressors, uh, which really were amplified when we saw what happened in the pandemic. Um, I think you know once one response to the burden of quality measurement has been well let's just streamline and reduce the number of measures that we're including make it less uh, confusing, make it less burdensome. And uh, the uh, Center for Medicare uh, Services actually um, published, uh, did an analysis of 500 quality measures across all of their programs and said, is there a, so a smaller set uh, that could be the universal foundation for measurement? And they selected 23 measures uh, from that. Turned out 70% of those were HEDIS measures, measures developed by NCQA. Uh, sort of further validating that we're on the right track with the measures that are in the uh, NCQA heat is set if we were going to focus effort in particular uh, uh, areas of population health. And I think the reason NCQA's measurement approach uh, was so successful is that it became an anchor solution and it solved a problem that we had in the 1990s, which we may now in the future not have anymore. Uh, it was good in the sense that we were evaluating at NCQA, we were evaluating operational capabilities and clinical processes that were important to populations. The notion of having an enrolled population and health plan was really powerful. And we were able to leverage standardized data from health plans, the claims administrative data. And actually you can still see variation at the health plan level in the quality of care. But what was bad about it is that we knew those claims data have limitations uh, and um, survey data also have their limitations for uh, evaluating quality. It's not really designed to uh, just compare the quality of delivery organizations or the clinicians and professionals uh, that are in those organizations. That actually requires a different design than the one we have. And there's little incentive in that world to improve electronic clinical data systems that really were kind of the solution we really wanted at that time. So what we end up with is a relatively broad brush, low resolution portrait of quality when we're using uh, the existing approach. Now I wanna uh, talk about the way that NCQA is approaching these challenges, uh, which is to innovate, to build better quality accountability programs. And I'll focus on two initiatives, we have several, but Equity-focused accountability and measurement is a key is a key one, uh, and recently we've invested a lot of effort there. And then digital quality measurement, which is where um, I think this really connects back to uh, uh, this audience in particular. Um, so the principles that we've gone into our 
uh, reform uh, with our one to lever leverage digital health data more than we have in the past, to align accountability programs with care improvement strategies more closely so that bolting on, we need to kind of get past that and, and actually align improvement with the accountability programs more than has been possible. And that means making measurement and reporting more real time, more useful in the stream of care during uh, the, the daily work of uh, clinicians, make it real time, make it actionable, clinicians and population health managers. Health equity has been a journey at NCQA. Uh, we had in 2010, a multicultural healthcare distinction uh, program that recognized uh, 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 pro, uh, institutions, organizations that were actually um, uh, focused on inequities and uh, capable of providing uh, the language supports and other supports to serve people from different cultures. Um, but I think in the uh, wake of uh, the pandemic and George Floyd's murder, uh, the staff uh, really stepped up and said, you know, our health, our multicultural healthcare distinction program doesn't really meet the needs in terms of uh, health equity and um, worked hard on uh, release, developing and releasing a health equity accreditation program specifically focused on organizations' capabilities uh, to um, uh, deliver care, diverse, uh, meet diversity, equity, and inclusion goals, and uh, reduce the disparities in care. And that work has continued on pretty very actively, actually. Uh, we released in June of last year a health equity plus accreditation, and it builds on the health equity accreditation base, which is an accreditation program of standards that an uh, organization could meet. But we know that health equity is a journey. It's not, a, the work isn't done. You don't achieve it, and then you're sort of set. So the notion is to build steps uh, and recognize that journey and the partnerships that are necessary to build over time with community-based organizations and with others uh, to serve serve the communities that uh, these organizations uh, operate in. And we're also in the process of building health equity into all of the NCQA programs, uh, including opportunities to add requirements um, around measurement, around the use of data, around reporting of race, ethnicity, and language data, collecting and using the data, to close disparity gaps. So I think this is a pretty exciting program. It sort of has um, brought together our accreditation programs, which have operated somewhat separately from our measurement programs. The accreditation in many cases requires performance measurement and reporting, uh, but uh, this uh, uh, effort I think is uh, causing, uh, is driving uh, organizations to do data collection and reporting in new ways. Uh, so in health equity accreditation, uh, we're required the uh, measures to be reported and stratified by race ethnicity this year. And we're actually just beginning to look at the data from that effort. We're also requiring collection of sexual orientation and gender identity data for adults. And um, looking at the uh, race, ethnicity, diversity of membership and scoring the, the completeness of data in that realm. So the idea here is to incentivize the use collection and use of data uh, to uh, drive equity. We're, um, as I just said, we're, we're addressing health equity through measurement with the idea that we want to uh, bring transparency to those inequities. Uh, in a research context, that's been done, but to do this broadly across the market as we can do it, I think is going to be powerful. Um, we're uh, working to make our measure development processes more inclusive. Uh, we're uh, focusing more on addressing social risks that are associated with health outcomes. So social needs screening and intervention, uh, social connection, or uh, what's sometimes called social isolation. Uh, we're working on uh, the SOGI, sexual orientation, gender identity, and disability uh, as areas for uh, uh, of disparity that um, uh, organizations could focus on. And then finally, the race, ethnicity, stratification I mentioned. I want to uh, connect this directly to the agenda in this room uh, at this conference. Uh, the um, uh, we, uh, NCQA specified a social needs screening and intervention measure in um, um, for measure year 2023. That's the year we're in right now. And uh, this measure um, and a similar measure that CMS has put into uh, its programs 
uh, look at screening for food insecurity, housing insecurity, and transportation insecurity. And then uh, in the case of the NCQA measure, also look at the intervention uh, opportunities. And um, uh, this is uh, reported across our commercial lines. Uh, I won't go through the measure specification here. Uh, we um, use link codes actually to identify the screening instruments. Uh, and there, are, it turns out there are dozens of screening instruments. Um, and the team went through all of those screening instruments, reviewed those with experts, and actually identified uh, a limited set that um, had met standards for validity and reliability and, and for, uh, evidence base. And uh, there are link codes for those, and we required that those be documented in electronic systems as part of the uh, move forward. The um, challenge in driving to LOINC, which we thought was really the way this should be done to be done effectively and accurately, is that state policies and payment systems are increasingly relying on Z codes and G codes to pay health plans, providers, and community-based organizations. So uh, uh, the, the challenge is that, again, we're sort of defaulting back to a claims-based approach to measuring quality as opposed to the nuanced clinical data approach we'd like. And several states are mandating specific data collection uh, instruments for Medicaid uh, managed care organizations uh, that don't have link codes in their systems, really. And that's disadvantaging those plans. And then community-based organizations ha don't have electronic health records. So the use of link in that context is actually really difficult. Uh, they, they have very little capability to support uh, electronic health records, technologies, and data exchange. Uh, so that's making it difficult as well. As I mentioned, uh, uh, CMS now has gone, announced in the summer they're going to use Z codes for this. And we think there are a lot of shortcomings to that approach, uh, specifically around the uh, attestation capability. You know, someone can just check a box and say, yeah, I screened for this without having done any sort of formal assessment. And, no, uh, and then the intervention is sort of unclear. So what we really want is a, um, a system that allows us to get a better portrait of quality, and that's clinical data. And uh, NCQA actually, uh, um, uh, I was at NCQA in the 1990s, and the, one of the projects I did in my fellowship year there was uh, on the future digital future of performance measurement. And this is where I connect back to Clem McDonald, because uh, we cited two of Clem's papers in this 1999 publication, where we outlined the need, the uh, what would the system look like, an electronic health data system for reporting quality. Uh, and we decided there were a, a seven essential features, uh, health data standard, data standards uh, are in there in several ways. So that number three, uh, 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 that's where we cited uh, Clem's work. And I went back and reread the paper that we cited from 1998, calling for health data standards and health affairs. And he made the point that this could be a multi-decade journey, uh, that that was true of most technologies. And uh, I took that to heart. We published this paper and I said, this is not gonna happen in my lifetime uh, because uh, the technology and infrastructure don't exist. Well, uh, I'm still alive and some things have happened that uh, brought me back to this agenda and said, I gotta pick this up again. So you know them, computing advances, uh, and technology advances that are making complex analysis feasible, and policy advances that are, are giving us tailwinds, the High Tech Act, the uh, uh, computerization of electronic health records, uh, fire data standards, I didn't see that coming, uh, to provide the architecture for health data exchange, and then regulations, which we had a hand in at the Commonwealth Fund standing up the Karen Alliance, which got some language into the uh, uh, Cures Right uh, Regulation, or Cures Act, uh, and ONC is now mandating the open API exchange of health data. So there's some really uh, positive uh, movement here on the electronic clinical data systems method. NCQA has been preparing for this. 2017, we announced the electronic clinical data systems method. The uptake has been somewhat limited, but we now are building uh, and guiding the notion of being able to uh, collect electronic for plans and others to use uh, structured electronic data for HEDIS measures. And um, I think people probably know what these are, but digital quality measures essentially translating what's now a narrative specification that has to be put in compute into computational form 
actually to doing the computational form using clinical quality language uh, and health data standards and actually making that the, the measures won't be sort of a description anymore. It will be actually the code that allows you to calculate and run the measure. Uh, in this future state, uh, we can actually get to the clinical nuances we want. Uh, uh, for instance, we can get to uh, clinical profiles. We can get to individualized clinical risk profiles. We can uh, understand how people move through care, their care journey across systems, because the data could be exchanged across those systems. Uh, we could get to patient preferences if we can figure out the data uh, assets that could be collected in electronic form there. And then we can start to build journeys uh, so we understand the significance of a positive or negative mammogram screen in this case, and, we act, and whether it's acted on. So I just want to sort of end by saying that we're, I think, on the verge of a pretty revolutionary change in the way we could do performance measurement. There's a lot that still needs to happen in the health data ecosystem to make this possible, including all the work that uh, you all are doing. There's some policy work that remains. But we have, uh, as of uh, a few weeks ago, we've now converted all 78 of the HEDIS measures into fire CQL specification uh, capable of running. Uh, in uh, uh, some early adopter programs that are actually just getting underway to sort of start testing this and troubleshooting uh, the work. And um, we're also excited to be announcing at our Health Innovation Summit next week that we're forming a digital quality implementers community uh, for organizations that want to come together to uh, work on the implementation of CQL. CQL is still a relatively immature standard uh, we need uh, better uh, CQL expectations, CQL engines. NCQA is open sourcing its CQL engine uh, in hopes of helping to drive the rest of the uh, ecosystem to create commercial grade CQL that could be uh, run across uh, uh, health plans, uh, ACOs, and other uh, organizations. So I think we're, again, I think we're on uh, the precipice of uh, significant change. It's happened in other industries. Healthcare has been lagging behind uh, banking, retail, and others have got there much earlier. But I think uh, we've sort of at the point where our current quality measurement systems without some sort of reboot have reached their limits. And uh, new types of measures that can be uh, at lower cost, uh, extracting data, extracting information from the data that is increasingly available in healthcare systems. Uh, these new types of measures are going to provide much more real time and much more actionable and, and, and are going to align better with what clinicians are doing in their day to day work. Uh, whether we'll succeed or not in getting to this high resolution portrait of the, the surface of other planets uh, is, uh, I think it's not an if anymore, it's a when. And, uh, but the success of that's going to depend on this uh, creativity, ingenuity, and dedication of uh, the health data standards community. And, implement, and the quality implementation community. So I'm very excited about this. I hope you are too. And I look forward to uh, uh, any questions you may have. Um, in, the, in the EHR space, obviously EHR vendors and, and CMS and ONC have been promoting uh, electronic clinical quality measures, ECQMs, yeah. and they're, they've been built into EHRs. They collect data directly from clinicians. They seem to use a lot of the at least, at least on paper, the definitions of them and so forth seem to use a lot of the features of the DQMs that that you've described. Yeah. You know, they use digital data. There's standards. There's a data model specified. Uh, the 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 measures are are defined with respect to standards, including SNOMED and NLOIC and RX Norm and so forth, as yeah. well as ICD-10. Um, and yet. Uh, something it, apparently something new is required that those aren't meeting the need for measuring clinical quality. What what is the gap there? What what is what is uh, missing in eCQMs and the whole eCQM system that the DQMs that that you, that you you've described uh, will address that? How, and or and how will the DQM system be different than the eCQM system yeah. uh, to address those? those gaps? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for that question. Uh, uh, I don't know if you've been tracking the experience that CMS has had with the eCQM reporting, which is that it works really well at an in, a single in institution level. 
So within my health data, uh, mini health data ecosystem, and, and the uh, actually ACO is not a, a good example, but a hospital system that has a mature uh, health data infrastructure, uh, they can run this and they can make it work. Where it gets challenging is the fire data exchange part. Uh, a lot of the data are not yet mapped to fire. And so they're even within an ACO that's made up of multiple hospital systems with different electronic health records, the exchange of data and the ability to query the data systems is not there yet. Uh, we also think, and we actually are working closely with CMS and with uh, the Drug Commission and others on the sort of data flow, the data architecture for the broader system, which would be enabling the exchange of data, not just from EHRs, but also from claims and administrative files from other data sources outside the EHR environment, uh, you know, lab and some of the others that uh, are familiar to folks, community-based organizations, if they get uh, acquire uh, some form of electronic record systems, behavioral health is another kind of uh, island. But the notion here is to advance beyond, and we said this in 1999, it can't be just each institution able to do its own measurement because then you can't get the, the power of following a patient across the system uh, and then using the data exchange to gather information about patients that isn't always available. Like I had information from in my system as a primary care doctor, and then the plan had information about where the patient was going in the rest of the system. I found that valuable, but that was not electronic. That was a fax that I might receive that would inform me that so-and-so had been in some other emergency room. That's the kind of uh, new ingredient here is that ability to exchange fire standardized data. That's a great question, thank you. That's a point of confusion about what the difference is between ECQMs. They're specified specifically for EHR environment. DQMs would be agnostic to the data source as long as it conformed to standards. Thank you for your presentation. My name is Lisbeth Sidirius from the Netherlands. I'm a pediatrician and I'm working within the European Academy of Pediatrics. And I was a bit amazed that children in the US even get less quality care compared to adults. Uh, so uh, I, I wonder how we as pediatricians together with the American Academy could improve quality measurements, uh, in fact, globally for children using uh, digital health and uh, uh, terminologies together and how we can be a stakeholder in this process. Yeah, the, I think the American Academy of Pediatrics has been a real, uh, has been a leader in this area. They've been very interested in this agenda. Um, the um, I had the pleasure of actually sitting in a GP practice in the Netherlands for a day and watching, observing how that health uh, data system worked. And I realized that um, the, the beauty and simplicity of that and the exchangeability of data were what made it really powerful. I think it's a, another instance where uh, the, the payment silos and the delivery silos in the U.S. and the lack of access that many people have, many children have in the U.S., uh, play into the quality problems that, that we have in the U.S. Again, if we can, uh, part of the efforts of NCQ early on, we had immunization measures and we were very focused on the pediatric populations enrolled in health plans. And actually in Medicaid, which ensures a large proportion of our uh, ch childhood population uh, because uh, many of them live in poverty, so they're eligible for Medicaid, but they're also covered under a special government program for the uninsured. Um, that population uh, um, in managed care is starting to reap some of the benefits, I think, of these health data capabilities. But again, the system I described, the future system, would help to uh, uh, incorporate that. And I think that there is a lot of standardization of, of FHIR and CQL globally, which I think will also help uh, to do the kind of, system of or, uh, study that I described from the Commonwealth Fund is also not possible in today's world without special data collection. What we really love to have is the ability to sort of have apples to apples data across uh, jurisdictions, and then we could actually do those comparisons more directly. But thank you, that's a great question. All set? Great. Thank you again.